Amen. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate that. Thank you for leading us in worship. Hey, now is the time that children are dismissed for Children's Church. Also, our Spanish-speaking Bible study is dismissed at this time. I don't see anybody back there for Children's Church. We do have it there, right? No, we do not. No, return to your seats, says Sean. <laughs> return. Don't worry, kids. I got you covered. I got a story for you you'll like. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so all of us then, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles, and we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the last chapter of the book we've been studying. Let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God. God's Word is holy, it is infallible, it is inerrant, it is inspired, and it is the authority over our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. It was neat seeing Sean break through the door like that. He's like, no, waving us off. Would have been chaos. Okay. Let's listen to the word. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Verse 5. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go, for I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I I am expecting him along with the brothers." Let's pray. Father, we want wide doors for effective work in your kingdom. That's what we want. We want to know what Paul knew. We want to have the opportunities of sharing the gospel. And Lord, right now is one of them. Right now is one of these times where you may open effectively wide doors to us in our lives and in our church. I pray that you would do that, Lord, and you would usher us through them so that we may walk forward in obedience and boldness and faith. And Father, now I pray that you would help me as I preach and help my people whom I love to listen as we go through the word of God and may your Holy Spirit have dominion in the room and guide our minds and form our hearts and shape us that we might be more like Jesus Christ. We pray in his name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. If you've ever wondered where I get my keen sense of humor, it's from my dad. He has a wonderful spirit of humor to him. He loves practical jokes. And when I say practical jokes, I don't mean the kind that, you know, embarrasses somebody or mocks somebody or puts somebody down. My dad, he loves to do these kinds of jokes where he sets up a little prank and then he'll step back and just see what happens. So, for instance, one time... I love this. My dad, he works for a, uh, a company that has a lot of high-tech equipment, and one time there was a piece of broken equipment. He brought it home, and he, he put NASA on it. He labeled it NASA, and he went to my sister's house in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, and he dug a hole in her front yard, <laughs> and he put this piece of equipment in there, and he, he even went so far as to burn all the grass all the way around the yard, and so... It looked like some piece of a satellite had fallen down from the sky and just happened to plunk down in her front yard. And he just sat back for the next few days and watched the family debate as to whether or not this was actually real. And there was a lot of debate, a lot of debate about that satellite that fell. And then this other time, this is my favorite story of my dad. He one time uh, went back to the behind his garage, brick wall, and he, he affixed a door 
to the back of the garage, a door that went nowhere. And in fact, he took all the time to frame it out and he put a big chain right across the door and a big warning sign that says, danger, do not enter. And then he just sat back. He just sat back and watched what happened. And my nephew, I have a specially curious nephew who saw this and all of a sudden it was like a You know, like he was sniffing out a a new piece of the property. He's looking at it and he's circling this door and he says, what is this, what is this door? Why, why, Why have I never seen this door before? And my dad said, oh, that's been there a long time. And after meals, he would come over and my little nephew, he would come over and he'd snoop around that door and then he began fidgeting with it and Soon enough later on, he had a crowbar out and he's trying to crowbar open this door and it began to plague his mind. It began to bother him. Where does this door lead? It doesn't seem like it should go anywhere. He looked around the garage and inside the garage, he could not figure out where in the world this door led to. And so eventually it got to plague him so much that my dad had to take him back behind the garage and actually open it and show him and prove to him that it went nowhere. And the rest of us, we just love to sit back and watch this little drama Unfold, And so I want to talk this morning about open doors from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 9 is especially my focus this morning. Paul says that there is a wide door for effective work. Now let's think about doors just for a moment. What is a door? A door is a portal that um, moves you from one location to the next. That's all it is. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. When I was in Scotland, I couldn't believe some of the doors that they had on the buildings. 500 years old, huge wooden double doors, some of them 12, 15 feet high, ornate, huge. They must have weighed several hundred pounds, each one of them. Gorgeous doors. And my home, nothing like that at all. We have thin little cardboard white doors and they serve just as well as any other door to get you from one room to the next. Some doors open for you. You go to Walmart or you go to Target and there's those sliding doors and they they know you're coming. The second you step up, the door opens. Boom. Other doors, no matter how hard you try, they don't open. They won't do it. Some of them are locked. Some of them are bolted closed. Some doors will take you on adventures. You go through a door of an airplane, you're going to end up in a foreign land. Other doors, like the one on the back of my dad's garage, literally go nowhere. And so let's think about that this morning. Open doors. Now a little bit of context in our passage here this morning. You'll be excited to know that this is the penultimate sermon in our series in 1 Corinthians. Penultimate means second to the last. Next week will be the last sermon in the entire book of 1 Corinthians. Finally we'll be through it. So you'll want to be there for that one. Next week also happens to be Father's Day as well. So we're going to look at uh, at verse 13 where it says to act like men. We'll do that next week. But this week uh, we're, we're working on some of these paragraphs that we might otherwise skip over. In fact, we've already seen the high point of 1 Corinthians. Now listen, if you've been here for the whole series, we saw a church that was kind of a wreck, if we're honest. The church of Corinth is a messy place. There's arguing, there's infighting, there's immorality. Paul has to straighten them out. Paul has to lower the apostolic hammer a few times and get fierce with the Corinthians. And then in chapter 15, I gave you what I think is the high point of the entire letter, which is Paul's teaching on the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection as well. We did all of that. And now we're to these last few paragraphs. These are kind of like the grocery list paragraphs of the letter. It's really a bunch of perfunctory stuff. I mean, look at the first paragraph of chapter 16, a little bit about offerings, how to take up an offering the right way. And then Paul gives us travel plans in verses five and following. And then all of a sudden there's this little verse in, in nine that just caught my attention. And I said, wow, wait a second. We've got to focus on this verse, just this verse today. And here it is. I'll read it to you again. For a wide door for effective work has been opened to me and there are many adversaries and that line just caught my attention and imagination this week. So let's talk about open doors. In fact, let me go ahead and give you the definition and then we're going to work through this one point at a time, okay? An open door, let's define it, is an opportunity given by the Lord, all right? For what? For the purpose of serving Him and His people, okay? requiring certain definitive steps of action on our part, 
whilst overcoming perhaps innumerable obstacles, which is also part of the process. So let me say that again. Open door is an opportunity given by the Lord to serve him and his people, requiring certain definite steps on our part while we overcome perhaps innumerable obstacles in so doing. So let's, uh, let's go back. Bible's open. Uh, we're in mostly verse 9 today, and let's just start off with an observation. It is the Lord who opens doors in our lives. In fact, that's what an open door is. It's an opportunity that he gives us. Now read the verse again. For a wide door for effective work has been opened to me. Let's pause there. That's a passive grammatical tense. It has been opened to me. Paul doesn't say, I did it. He doesn't say, I opened this door. He says, the door was opened to me. I stepped through. Boom, it opened up. I'm going to walk through it now. That's my plan. Do you understand? Do you know? Do you believe? Do you trust that God is the one who actually opens the doors of your life? Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is the one who presents opportunities and challenges for you? Do you believe the one, that he is the one who's actually controlling your destiny and writing your story? Do you believe that it is God who's actually the one who's ordering all the circumstances of your life? Or do you think, perhaps, contrarily, that everything's just happenstance, that there are such thing as coincidences, that the world is essentially chaos, and even your life is just kind of a meandering mess. Do you believe that? Or do you believe that it's God who's actually the one who is opening doors, closing certain doors, in fact, but he's the one that is working behind the scenes? I believe that. I believe it's the one that, that, it's, that it's God who actually presents the opportunities to us such that, listen to this, Whenever the Lord opens a door, nobody can close it. And whenever the Lord closes a particular door, what? Nobody can open it. And it's he who determines how wide the door will be, how long the door will be opened, and when he will close the door when it's open. He, when it's over, he, de- he determines these things. Now, let me just pause right here and say that sometimes... There are doors that are so great in our lives that if you were to step through it, your whole biography of your life will change. There are doors that are so great that if you were to step through that particular door, your obituary that they will write about you one day will literally be different. Okay, so what kinds of great doors might those be? Well, uh, maybe you're considering moving across the country to take a particular job. That's going to change your life if you step through that door. Maybe you're considering right now fostering a child or adopting a child or having a child through natural birth processes. If you do that, your life is going to be changed forever. Maybe you're thinking about being called into the ministry. Maybe God is calling you, and what you're actually considering is whether or not you should be obedient and following that step. If you do it, your life's going to be different. From this point on, there are certain doors that when you walk through them, you will be a different person, okay? So there's that. But there's also what we might call smaller doors. There's, there's lesser doors. And that doesn't mean they're not, they're not as significant. It doesn't mean they're unimportant. Sometimes a door of an opportunity provided by the Lord might be as small as simply a conversation. There's an opportunity for you to be able to mention Christ or what he's done in your life. That's a door, right? Maybe your schedule and your work week is, is really packed and then all of a sudden somebody cancels a meeting. Now what? You've got an hour that's free. That's an open door. What are you going to do with it? You're going to pray? You're going to study your Bible? You're going to meet somebody for coffee? That's an opportunity. And so some doors are great and they'll change our lives forever. Some doors are so small, but here's the deal. Even the small ones, even those small little doors that seem like they're insignificant at the time, you begin to step through them obediently, more and more obedience, just following Christ, trusting Christ. Those little doors usually end up leading to bigger doors and greater doors. Maybe a literal door is the one you need to knock on. Maybe your neighbor's door, an elderly person or something like that in your neighborhood that needs you to physically knock on their door to check on them, to let them know that you love them and care for them. There are great doors and there are small doors. But let's deal with this. Sometimes doors are simply closed no matter what we do, right? 
You're like, come on, Lord, what are you doing? This should be open. I thought this was your will. Lord, I thought this is exactly what you were calling me to. It seems like this door should be open. Lord, I have the keys in my hand. I'm going through them one at a time. None of them is opening this door. What's going on? Flip with me to Acts chapter 16. I want to show you what happens when doors are irrevocably closed. What we're going to see is two doors close so that a third can be opened. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God in Asia. Closed door. And when they come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Closed door. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see the pattern there? Closed door, closed door, keep knocking, keep pursuing, keep seeking his will, open door. Now, this is actually the second missionary journey of Paul. It's really interesting to look at this on the map. What's happening here is they're moving across Galatia, and I know you don't have a map in front of you right now, but do this a little bit later. Go back and look at the second missionary journey of Paul. You probably have a map just like that in the back of your Bible, and they're trying to press, first of all, they're going to try to press north, and, and, and the Spirit of God says, nope, nope, not north, and so they're like, okay, well, where do we go? Well, let's press west, let's press due west, and the Spirit of Jesus says, nope, not going to be due west, and so they're forced by constraint to go northwest and what happens is they come to the end of the land and they cross over the Aegean Sea and all of a sudden God opens up this tremendous opportunity that ends up being the rest of chapter 16 so that the next couple paragraphs we see are two dramatic conversions, right? Look at down at verse 11, we're still in Acts chapter 16. So Lydia gets converted as a result of their having crossed over the sea and they happen to meet her on this particular day where a bunch of Jewish women are gathering for prayer. And what I would say to you is simply this, if they had pressed onto the north or if they had pressed onto the west, Lydia would not be saved. God ordered the events of Paul's life so that he arrived at that particular place at that particular time so that Lydia's heart would be opened up to the gospel. And here now we have this tremendous open door. Lydia becomes one of the great sponsors and friends of the apostolic mission. Okay? Here's another thing, same chapter, same chapter 16, Paul is now in prison, Paul and Silas, and all of a sudden in the middle of the night there's this earthquake and they have this opportunity to preach the gospel to this Philippian jailer who hears them singing and he knows that they've got something that he doesn't have in their lives, they've got this joy, they've got this faith in Christ, and so the Philippian jailer repents and believes, and so I would say to you this, if they had gone on with their original plans of door A and door B, they would have never gone through door C, and therefore they would have never been there in the very night that the earthquake hit so that the Philippian jailer could hear the gospel and be saved. And you say, of course, of course that's what God was doing. It makes so much sense when you look back on it after the fact. But that's how these closed doors tend to work, don't they? We assume it should open to us the way that we want it to be when in fact God has a greater plan than we could have ever imagined. So that's why he closes door. So what is an open door? An open door is an opportunity provided by the Lord. All right, let's go on to the second point. What, are the po- what, is, what is the idea? What is the purpose behind these open doors? Well, the purpose behind them is to serve God and his people. Notice that Paul says, what kind of a door is it? It's a door that's wide open for effective work. That's what's been open to me. Now, what does Paul mean by effective work? Does it mean his business prospects are taken off lately? Is that what that means? Effective work? Probably not. Paul's a tent maker, but I don't think that's exactly what he has in mind. Does it mean that his business reputation, does it mean that everything that, that he's touching is turning to gold? Does it mean that he's, he's getting international acclaim for his No, the effective word there has to do with not business prospects or effective time management. That's not what we're talking about here. The word effective has to do with 
the people that he's serving. It's effective, not because Paul is gaining fame or reputation or fortune or he's accumulating goods or his business is flourishing. That's not what we mean. It's effective because lives are getting changed in Ephesus. And that's what the ministry is about is, is people. It's about changing lives. And so Paul is like, man, Corinthians, I know I'm going to get to you. But this door in Ephesus right now is so wide open. You have to understand, people are hearing the gospel. People are being saved. People's lives are being transformed. Uh, it's, it's rare, isn't it, in the ministry? Think about it, to have these sort of seasons of outpouring where, where everything just tends to be working. And most of ministry, if I'm completely honest, is is somewhat difficult, it's somewhat repetitive, it's arduous, it's, it's hard. It's like hoeing the field with a hoe or a shovel that keeps hitting the rock. And a lot of it is, you know, investing time and, and people and not seeing fruit necessarily until sometimes later. Sometimes we never see our fruit at all. But what Paul's saying here is, look, there is, for whatever reason, I can't explain it, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, there is a door that is opened in Ephesus, and I, and I cannot turn my attention away from this right now because people's lives are being changed, okay? And sometimes, look, here's, here's the problem is sometimes when we think of open doors, we think of success, we think of acclaim, we think of numbers, we think of projects, we think of uh, things that are going to end up in lights or on billboards or written about in newspapers, but I want to tell you that most of the open doors in your life are not going to be like that. They're not. They're not going to be attention-seeking type of doors. They're going to be the kind of things that simply, faithfully, obediently, and very quietly often change lives. And so I just, I just want to encourage you today, if, if you're not seeing big, huge doors with neon signs opening up in your life, maybe it's the open door for you is simply to care for the people that you love in your life. Like, like, think about this. I know a couple of people right now, their job, their job, somebody pays them to take care of an elderly person. And that's important work. Like, who else is going to do that? Is that going to be written about in a newspaper? No, it's not. It's never going to get some great attention or fame, but that is important work. I know several people whose very job is to care for an elderly person that can't care for themselves anymore. That's an open door. That is an open door. And I know other people whose open door right now is to homeschool their children. And I would just say, I commend you for that. You have a door. It's wide open. 18 years it's going to be open in your home. And you have the opportunity to educate your own children. Nobody's ever going to write up that. Nobody is ever going to make much of that. But you're going to serve faithfully and patiently your children, teaching them the things that they need to know in this difficult world. That's a a door. For some of you, you're going to lead a Bible study, a small group, and you're just going to care for your friends. Others of you are going to, you're going to give attention to widows and the shut-ins, and that's, that's your door. And I, I just want to, let me quote for a minute, for a minute uh, Eugene Peterson. You probably know him because he's the author of the Bible translation called The Message. Have you heard about that? Now, sometimes we tease the Bible translation, the message, because it's actually the one that goes the furthest away from the Hebrew and the Greek. It's really a paraphrase. That's what it is. And so his reputation as a translator, you either love it or hate it. Uh, myself, I don't use the message very often. But Eugene Peterson is a, is a powerful writer. He has a lot of other books out there. A lot of them are to pastors. And one of the things that he says that I'll never forget is that pastors in particular need to resist the urge to be where the action is. It's one of his mantras. You've got to resist the urge to be where the action is because everybody wants to be in those ministries or those programs or those dynamic things that are getting all the attention. But the problem is you've got all this other stuff out here that simply needs to be attended by faithful Bible-believing Christians, including all of the ministries and the persons that might otherwise be ignored or swept away. Okay? Effective work. It doesn't mean neon lights. It means faithfulness and patience and stick to Third, requiring certain definite steps of action. Okay, so who opens the door? All right, that was not convincing that you remember point one. <laughs> who opens the door? 
That's right. And yet there are also certain definite steps that we must take to walk through these kinds of doors. Now, if you look for a minute at the Apostle Paul, just look at him in the book of Acts. Would you categorize him as A, a man of action, or B, a man of passivity? Clearly, he's a man of action. Paul is constantly on the move. He is constantly preaching. He's constantly in danger. He's constantly going up against opponents. He's constantly here. He's constantly there. He's moving about. He doesn't stop the entire book of Acts. He's a man of action, right? And so in order to, in order to walk through doors, well, it's kind of implied, isn't it, that you actually have to do what? Step through them. Yes, you sometimes literally need to act. You need to take a step. And sometimes there's planning and there's preparation involved. Sometimes there's scheduling. Sometimes there's foresight. And yet you come to a point where you're looking at the door. There it is right in front of you. What are you going to do? Are you going to stare at it? What are you gonna, you're going to wait to be carried through? You're going to lean through the door? No, you're going to step through the door. And so Paul says, he actually gives them his itinerary here in chapter 16, back in 1 Corinthians, verse 5. Look, look at this and following. He gives them his action plan. There, there's nothing ungodly about making plans, is there? No. It's a good thing to do to make plans. He says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. Definite plan. For I intend to pass through Macedonia. That's an intention. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey. That's a contingency wherever I go. Another contingency. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. That's a personal motivation. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. That's a causal necessity. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door of effective work has opened to me motivation and there are many adversaries, obstacle. That looks to me like definite steps, doesn't it? If you want to do something, if you want to be something, if you want to affect some change, then it necessarily requires you to actually take a step. I can promise you that you will never affect great change. You will never change many lives. You will never do something momentous if you simply stand there and look at doors and hope that they not only open for you but also carry you through. You have to act. Now, whether you take a large step of faith or whether you take eight tiny steps of faith is really unimportant, but the matter is you must keep progressing if you want to actually do the Lord's work. And there's nothing wrong with planning, strategizing, and foresight in order to make that happen, okay? So definite steps of action. Now, I want to get on to the fourth point because I find this to be very interesting, that there are, even with open doors, adversaries and obstacles, okay? So what is an open door? It's something the Lord provides to serve him and his people, requiring definite steps on our part. But watch this. While we often overcome many obstacles. Look again at verse 9. There are many adversaries. Do you believe that open doors should come obstacle-free for you? Does that seem reasonable? Does it seem reasonable that anything in this world that's worth doing or accomplishing should come to you without any possible problem, hindrance, or delay? I don't think that's a reasonable expectation, especially when I look at my Bible. It seems like everything that is worth doing is worth overcoming in order to accomplish it. In fact, Paul says here that there's a particular kind of obstacle in his way, namely, many adversaries. Not just a few, but many. And so some of us, here's what we do. Okay, this is wrong thinking on our part. We think to ourselves, okay, if the Lord is going to use me, then he had better make my way absolutely clear so it seems just as easy as cake for me to accomplish his will. Problem, it never is. There's always adversaries. If it's not this kind, it's another. Here it happens to be actual adversaries. And when we read the book of Acts, we see people coming up against them at every turn. At every turn, there's somebody there to discourage Paul. There's somebody there to tell him that he's wrong, to accuse him of blasphemy, to throw him in jail. Paul, everywhere he goes, he's constantly meeting adversaries, and yet if there's one thing that the Apostle Paul has, it's perseverance. 
And so you will encounter many obstacles, even in the doors that are wide open, wide open, many, many adversaries. What kind of adversaries will you encounter? Well, let's name off a few. First of all, unbelievers. They're also our goal to reach them, by the way. Don't forget that. We must love them. We must care for them. We must show them the gospel. But sometimes the greatest obstacles, the greatest hindrances to us are unbelievers because, hope you know this, there are some people that actually disagree with us about matters of faith and life. They're not our opponents to be conquered. They're not our enemies to be thrown down. What they are is our goal to reach them with the love of Christ. But some of them will resist you and they will resist you ferociously. Do you know that? Why do they do that? Because they don't believe. Why don't they believe? Because the Lord hasn't opened their heart. Well, who else is your obstacle? Unbelievers? Guess what? Who's next on the list? Believers will sometimes be a hindrance to you. Now, this shouldn't be like this. But look, we're not fools, right? We've got the book of 1 Corinthians in front of us. The church is a mess at times. Sometimes we disagree with each other. Sometimes we have different ways or different strategies or different methodologies. Sometimes the person that that will discourage you the most is actually another believer. And they will say to you, your plan's crazy. It's never gonna work. Already tried it that way before. It didn't work then. Why would it work now? And believers... Sometimes we have a way of throwing water on somebody else's fire, even as they're, they're burning with a passion or an idea or a new concept, and then another Christian comes along and throws water on it, throws a wet blanket on it. Resolve that you will not be that kind of a Christian, that you will not be the wet blanket kind of a Christian for another person's passion for service. That is one of the most discouraging things in the world, is when somebody who should be on your team actually hinders you from doing what you think the Lord is calling you to do. Don't be that guy. What other kinds of obstacles are there? Well, there's the spirit realm. Uh, there is a personal devil that hates you and your mission. Okay? He has many minions called the demons that will resist you at every turn. They will, ter- they will turn up all kinds of obstacles so that you might stub your toe in the serving of the Lord. But the good news is the gospel overcomes the evil one. Amen? Last one, worthy of mention. Who else might be your greatest obstacle at certain parts of your life? yourself. We have a way of tripping over ourselves. We have a way of causing ourselves to stumble. We have a way of getting in our own way, even despite our best intentions. So we need to pray. So what do you do? Here's a door. Seems to be open, but there's obstacle. There's the hindrances of the way. There's people that want to stop me from this. Let me give you a math formula. I'm not a math guy myself, but write this down. Prayer plus perseverance equals progress. Got it? Prayer plus perseverance, you can't be a quitter, for goodness sakes, equals progress. If the door is open, you will make progress that way. Now, I, I have a mirror in, in my study, and I sometimes write things on there to encourage myself. That's, that's what I have written on my mirror right now, prayer plus perseverance equals progress. I also have another little phrase written right below it. It says, um, obstacles do not equal impossibilities, right? Just because you have an obstacle in your way, just because something is blocking you, there may be something you have to go around or over or under or through, does not make it impossible for you to accomplish that goal. It doesn't, okay? So prayer plus perseverance equals progress, and obstacles do not equal impossibilities. Now, before we wind down here in just a moment, uh, and we will land the plane in a few, I promise, it would seem to make sense that I would actually provide to you some open doors today. Some of you are saying, man, I just, I wish something would open for me. I haven't seen a door open. Lord, show me a door. Give me something to step through. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a few suggestions. First of all, how about you consider walking through the open door of serving in our children's ministry? Would you consider that? Would you pray about that? Can I just put that there as a, as a possible door? It's wide open. We have VBS this week. We have two weeks of kids camps coming up this summertime. They are amazing. Our staff have been working so hard to make sure all of these things go off smoothly. And I'm going to tell you what, we're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel with families in our neighborhood, in our city that don't normally come to church. That's an open door, Faith Church. Somebody say amen. 
And who's going to walk through that? All the paid staff will. Okay, yeah, they're going to. But what about joining them? But then here's the deal. Watch this. What after VBS? What after the kids' camps that are going to be so amazing this summer? Well, we have a nursery ministry that grinds along patiently, quietly, never gets any attention. We got nursery provided every single week of the year. How about serving in that kind of a ministry where you will not get acclaim and fame and neon lights and lasers and all that kind of stuff? You'll just faithfully serve the children of our church that are growing up in our congregation. Is that an open door? I think it is. I think so. Let me throw another one out there for you. You heard a minute ago about Elder Mario. John made this announcement that Mario wants to canvas the neighborhoods and share the gospel. I think that's the most amazing goal that we could come up with for this year. Who's going to join him? Who's going to do that? Who's going to show up with Mario on the third, what is it, third Saturday of the month? Visit the neighborhoods, knock on doors, invite people to church. What an amazing opportunity to step through a door. You're going to have to take a definite step, though. You're going to have to show up. There it is. I did it. Now what? Here's a neighborhood. Highlight a section on a map. All right. I'll step under this door. I'll start knocking on doors. Thank you, Mario, for doing that for our church. We need that right now. It's good. It's wonderful. You say, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to commit to like a long-term project or program. I don't know. I don't know. How about how about something for one day? Okay. July 21st, we're going to have a work day here at Faith Church, and we're going to clean up all the brush in the yard. We've got a lot to do. We've got a building project going on. Could you step through a one-day door on July 21st and help us out with the work project? That'd be great. I think you probably could. Let's do it. You ready? Okay, now, one more thing I have to say. Flip with me to John chapter 10. Of all the doors that we've mentioned this morning, this is the greatest. Of all of the opportunities we've talked about, there is none so great as this one in John chapter 10. Listen to the words of our Savior. John 10, verse 7. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. This is the first door. This is the first and the greatest door. Jesus says, look, you want to have life? Come through me. And so even as we're discussing all these matters today, I would simply say to you, if you've not yet walked through the door of faith in Christ Jesus, look what's written above the door, faith and repentance. That's what it says. And if we're going to live a significant life, if we're going to live a meaningful life that that has an effective change for people's hearts and lives, the very first thing we need to do is to first of all come to him because believe me, you will be entirely ineffective. You will find yourself thwarted time and time again in this life if you have not walked through that first door, the first door of faith and repentance and belief. Don't stand in the hallway. Don't stand in the hallway. Don't go to the door that says religion. Don't go to the door that says self-help. Don't go down the door that says self-improvement. Don't go down to the door that says I'll get my my life right later. Go to the door right now that says trust, repentance, and faith. In Christ and enter through that door. If you've already done that, then now go on to serve him with your life. If you've not yet gone through the door of faith in Christ Jesus, then I would simply ask you, what better time than right now? This could be the very moment that you turn over your life to the Lord. He's prompting you, he's calling you, he is pleading with you, and like every other doors, what must you do? There must be a definitive step. It begins with repenting, putting your hope in him, acknowledging that without him in your life, every single door in the hallway leads nowhere, leads to death. But with, you, with him, not only will he open up that great door of eternal life, but he will begin to use you in ways that you could not possibly fathom. So let's pray to him and ask him that he would right now open that door of salvation. Father, we thank you 
we thank you for open doors. We thank you that Christ provided the only way through to eternal life through his blood, his death, and his resurrection. Lord, if there's anyone here that has not yet uh, given their lives to you, I pray, God, that you would be drawing them, that you would, you would literally carry them through that door as it is impossible for us to walk through on our own strength. And Father, I pray that you would use our church. Lord, we have opportunities in front of us this summer and next fall that will astonish and amaze us. Lord, you know, we know that you want to use our church in our, in our neighborhood, in our city, to bring the light of the gospel to the world. Father, I pray that, that we would never come up to a door of opportunity and simply turn away from it because we're, we're not bold or we're not courageous or we're unwilling or unprepared. Father, we love you and we trust you. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand together for the benediction as we close. In a minute, we'll sing our final hymn. Um, thank you to everybody who's preparing for VBS this week. Thank you for all the work that you've already done in advance of that. After the service today, the elders will be available to pray with you. Up here on my left, your right. If you would like to commit your life to the Lord today, as we mentioned, the great door of Christ, the elders will be there to pray with you or talk to you about what's going on in your circumstances. Also, if you need help, maybe you've run into a bit of a hard time financially or just seem like every other door is closed uh, materially or in providing for your family by necessity, the deacons will be available to talk to you about that if you'd like. So let's receive the benediction now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Love you lots. Have a great week.